the commandments reveal God's love for us and the love that he wants for us to have for one another. So the sixth commandment is focused on love, and it simply reads, you shall not murder. You find this in Exodus 20, verse 13. The sixth commandment focuses on the value of human life. And I hope that you are putting the building blocks together as we go through these because last week we saw the importance of honoring our family, honoring our mother and our father. And it's not just that. It's who we are as people, our responsibility, our accountability. As parents, we are to teach our children so that then, in fact, they grow up to teach their children God's ways of love. And that is how it's supposed to go. God is all about family, and he wants for us to follow in his footsteps and teach one generation after another what his amazing ways are all about. And imagine if there is absolutely no respect for parents how much respect there's going to be for others. And if we don't respect our parents, and if we don't honor our parents, then it's not very likely that we are going to value other human life. So important that we make that connection. And as we grow to understand ourselves better, understand our needs, it's so helpful in understanding others and their needs. When we understand how God made us and how he values each person, then we can, in turn, learn to value others. It's not that we automatically know how to do that. It's that God teaches us one day at a time, one day at a time, how to value others and how he values us. What we have to get, first of all, is that human life to God is sacred. God gives life. Only God can take life. He is the giver. He breathed his breath. You and I exist because of him. We have his breath in our being right now. Number two, why we're sacred is that we are made in his image. We are made in the image of God. Imagine how grand that is. And number three, that God made human beings to live together and to be in relationships with one another. That is why God created children, Adam and Eve, to relate to them and then said, be fruitful and multiply, to have a huge family and to be able to relate and have relationships, not just with us, but that we would have them with one another, and we can't be successful with that, we can't, meaning that we can't glorify God in that if we don't value every human life, every human life. So it's all about relationships, and what we have to have in the midst of every relationship as we relate is love. And it's not any kind of love that you and I can conjure up. It's love that he gives as the branch is plugged into the vine, guess what the branch gets? Nourishment. And that nourishment is love and everything that love is, which is we can't describe in just one word or in one sentence. There are many, many facets to what love is. So let's look. Is there a difference between killing and murder? There's two distinct Uh, definitions that we need to understand. To kill is to cause the death of a person, an animal, or a living thing. But to murder is the unlawful, premeditated killing of one human being by another. So the commandment, if your Bible says, thou shall not kill, is not a good translation. Thou shall not murder. Because there are instances where God instructs us to kill, to take a life. Murdering, however, is not a part of God's plan. Let's look at Genesis 9. Whoever sheds human blood by humans 
shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. Why is that? Because the life is in the blood. Life was in the blood of Jesus. He spilled his blood for us. We're covered in his blood, and we are washed white as snow. And so God values us so much that if we take a life, then our life must be given in payment for that life. Anyone who takes the life of a human being is to be put to death. And anyone who assaults and kills another person must be put to death. But if it was simply an accident permitted by God, I will appoint a place of refuge, this is Moses, where the slayer can run for safety. However, if someone deliberately kills another person, then the slayer must be dragged even from my altar and put to death. This means if somebody kills somebody and then realizes, uh... Now I'm going to have to pay for that. And they run to the altar and say, please, 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 I'm sorry. I I won't do it again. God says, drag them away from the altar and put them to death. Life for life. God is serious about the value that he places on every human being. Now, accidental death, something happens and you, you you run over someone accidentally. You somehow caused the death of someone's life accidentally, God had set up cities of refuge that someone who killed someone accidentally could go to a place to live. Now, it it didn't mean that if the avenger, the next of kin, if they got to you before you got to the city of refuge, they could take your life, life for life. And it's still life for life. You would have to go live in one of those cities, and you would have to stay there until the high priest died, and then you would be free to go. Still a life for life. That is never, ever moved. That is in stone. So God made perfect provision in every situation to deal with life and the taking of life. If, however, a man hates his neighbor and lies in wait, attacks him, kills him, and then flees to one of these cities, you're guilty, but you try to get to the city to to have a place of safety, the elders of his city must send for him, bring him back, and hand him over to the avenger of blood to die. So if you're guilty and you run somewhere to go and take refuge, he's saying, "Uh uh-uh, it's not going to work. You must show him no pity. You are to purge from Israel the guilt of shedding innocent blood that it may go well with you. If we still lived according to this, we'd have a lot less problems. I mean, obviously where we are today, there is no value for human life. There is very, I should say, there is very little value for human life. If a thief is caught breaking in at night and has struck a fatal blow, the defender is not guilty of bloodshed. There are instances where self-defense, God says, you're not guilty. So your life is not, when you're protecting your property and your family, and someone breaks in at night, however, it goes on to say if it's during the daylight, not so much. It would not be an accident. You would know who they are. You might take care of it another way. However, if someone is attacking you, God gives us the right to defend. So God gives life, and God can take life. This happens in war. Remember, he sent David to wipe out an entire city and Saul, Joshua. There are times when the full full cut principle is in play. God has done everything that he can do to bring people around, and still they refuse to repent. There's nothing that God can do. So he would have to annihilate entire groups of people. And also what we just read, capital punishment, you take a life, you get life. We've gotten so soft on this in our society. We, we think that when someone takes a life, that they're due to be sit in prison for, you know, 50 years. That's not what God says. So violence. Why is it that the world is consumed with watching violence? 
if God stands so adamantly opposed to the taking of life, to the shedding of blood, if God says, I want you to value human life as the highest thing in my creation, then why is it that we are consumed as a society with violence, with watching violence, with paying money to watch violence, with playing games that are all about violence? What is violence? Behavior involving physical force intended to hurt, damage, or kill someone or something. And mostly every TV show, if you were to watch network TV, is filled with every kind of of murder that is imaginable, every scenario. The big screens are full of shows that deal with murder and with many kinds of abusive violence. It's because life has become disposable. We have disposable diapers, disposable razors, disposable paper plates. Everything's disposable in our, in our world, and so's life. It's just a life, no big deal. The gang mentality, so what? It's just a life. What, what are they worth? Very little. As I was contemplating that, I had a little girl in our pre-K classroom who told me about a movie that she went to see five years old. And I looked up, I said, what is this movie about? And she told me about some things in the movie. So I went and looked this up. In case you're not familiar with Plugged In, it's focused on the family's review site for looking at movies before you go. Before you go and encourage Hollywood to to break all the commandments with you going to give them money, read what this is about. This is what this movie was about. In this movie that a five-year-old went to watch, A character has his head lopped off. An arm is hacked off as well. Lots of things blow up. We also see roughly three bazillion battles. People and creatures get impaled, stabbed, sliced, hacked, disintegrated, shot, thrown like ragdolls, hit, kicked, stomped, and in at least one case, squished, and otherwise hurt, some characters die. Five-year-old. I'm going to go back to... Last week's lesson on parents. Parents, what are we doing allowing our kids to be involved in anything like this? Do you understand that this kind of stuff numbs and dulls the senses? This kind of of action, this kind of viewing this violence appeals to our flesh because it seems distant and remote. It's inter- it becomes entertainment. How is it that we're entertained by commandment-breaking things? How is it so entertaining? And then we wonder why our kids grow up and have no spiritual interest. It's because this is a stimulation that they come to know. God's boring compared to this. God doesn't appeal to the flesh like this. does. And if this isn't bad enough... If you, and there, there are several good ones I just happen to like, focus on the families. But they'll also, they'll tell you everything about the movie. So before you go, you're going to know what the whole movie is. But if you're going to go to a movie, you should check out what you're getting yourself into and what you're dragging your kids to see and what you, as a follower of Jesus Christ, are putting a stamp of approval on. When you go watch this garbage, then you are telling those around you, I, I, I'm part of this. I'm good with this, and you go see it too. You you are giving your stamp of approval to this stuff that's going on. If this is not bad enough, language, five-year-old. PG-13 means that you can have one F-bomb in the movie, and then you can abuse God's name and put everything else in here that you can think of. By the way, That review is for a movie called The Avengers. Anger. Violence begins here. Dealing with anger. The root of murder and the root 
of violence begins in our hearts. And learning to deal with anger at its beginning is paramount to you and I having control of our feelings instead of allowing our feelings to control us. Remember when we went through the study on Joshua and Moses leading the children of Israel out of, the, out of Egypt and how the people were murmurs and complainers. They were negative. They complained. They murmured against God. They murmured against Moses and Aaron. That's where it starts. It starts from us taking our eyes off of the Lord, the one who can give us what we need to value what's important and putting it on each other. You and I, we can't meet each other's needs like God can. We don't need to look to each other to meet our needs. We look to God to meet our needs, and when he gives us love, then we can bear with one another in love as we walk this journey called life. God demands that you and I be changed from flesh living to spirit living. Anger is a dangerous emotion because it turns to rage. the, the, The thing called road rage or going postal, you know, we have all kinds of terms for for this kind of dangerous emotion that is not kept in check. It becomes abusive. So if you've ever been cussing people out on the road, you become abusive. You are abusing your neighbors that you don't know going down the road. And aggressive. And you're going to a place that you could go that is not going to go well for you. If your desire Faith Fellowship, if your desire is to glorify God in how you are living your life, then this must be something that you think about seriously and how you are dealing with your emotions and how you are allowing God to help you deal with your emotions. Because murder is the most destructive form of anger. That's what murder is. It starts with anger that turns to rage that says, I am out of control, and now I hate you so much, I'm going to take your life. And as we know, if we watch the news, even if you watch it once a year, people get upset over the smallest of things. I wanted to be next in line, and you took my place, so I'm going to kill you. I mean, it doesn't take anything for people to absolutely have no value for, for the sacredness of human life and to just get rid of someone. Is anger a bad thing? No, because God gets angry. But God never gets out of control. In fact, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. There is anger that is justified. And God gets angry when one child hurts another. That is not ever okay. And that's the kind of thing that we need to be angry about when someone is hurting someone else. However, being angry because... Something is irritating us or something's frustrating us or we're disappointed about something is no reason to get angry. Parents, you and I need to lead by example. However we deal with our feelings and our emotions, we are being watched by those around us. And if you don't have children, children are still watching you. If you're an adult, how you deal with yourself is being noted. Hmm. They love the Lord, and look how they talk. They love the Lord, and look what they're doing. Learn to control your feelings so that your children learn to control theirs. They learn by example. Let's go to the book of James this morning. If you'll open up to chapter 3, we can't talk about anger without looking at how that anger gets expressed. Rough. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter 3, because we need to understand clearly how we murder on a daily basis through using words, how it is possible to break this commandment on a daily basis just from what comes out of our mouth. 
Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Wouldn't it just be amazing when that would be us? That is what we have to look forward to. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person and sets the whole course of his life on fire, and it is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame the tongue. Read the next line carefully. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men, here's this phrase again, who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. It is so important that you and I learn to subdue our feelings, to put them under control so that we can deal with our disagreements and our differences in a godly way. And that's, that's really part of the whole thing with learning how to relate to one another is how to deal with differences and disagreements. Because we're going to have them. We're all very different. And it's okay to have differences. And it's okay to disagree on things. But how do we deal with them? How do we take care of them? Do we allow our anger to just rise up in a, in a hurry and get rageful and yell and allow poison to come from our mouths? Or do we allow the Spirit of God to have his way? And therefore, we are calm. And we are able to talk things out with respect and with value for the other person. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. How many of you have experienced this? Oh, everyone's hand should be up. Every one of us has given the devil a foothold by going to sleep angry. We get angry about something. Thank you, Nico. You're very honest. <laughs> we have all done that because, you know what, we're so prideful. And we don't want to be the first one to apologize. We don't want to be the first one to say, I'm sorry, because it was the other person's fault. And so we go to bed, and we twist, and we turn, and we have all kinds of convulsions within ourselves. And, yeah, and the Lord's saying, could have had a good night's sleep if you'd have just made things right. That's, that's how this works. I, I'm telling you to do this for your own good, for your own peace of mind. Go with me to the book of Genesis, and let's look at the first murder that occurred and how it happened and how you and I are in the same dangerous place unless we allow the Spirit of God to have his way in us. Genesis chapter 4. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. Verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering... 
he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. That means that Cain was offended, and he was offended with God because God wouldn't accept what he wanted to offer. He refused to bring God what God demanded. He brought God what he wanted to give. That is the problem of our lives. You know that. You recognize that. We need to apply all of these little lessons to our heart because when God says, like what we just talked about, God says, do not let the sun go down in anger. And we go, hmm, we're going to do it this way. Same attitude as Cain had. So he's saying, why? God says, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, Sin is crouching at your door. The devil is there to push you to rebel, to push you to be defiant, to push you to be prideful. It desires to have you, but you must master it. How do we master sin? Through repentance. The key. And you won't have that without humility. Always goes back to that. And you won't have that if you are a branch that's not plugged into the vine because you and I cannot manufacture humility if we tried. The Holy Spirit gives us humility. And humility leads us to repentance. So we know what happened. Abel said, I don't think so. I mean, Cain said, I don't think so. So he lured his brother out to a field, and he murdered him. He planned it. It's premeditated murder to think, make a plan, lure somebody out, kill them. And so God comes and says, uh, where's Abel? And he's still in his rude, prideful mode. He says, am I my brother's keeper? God, don't you know where he is? How would I know where he is? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Now, what did Cain deserve at this moment? Yeah, the same thing Adam and Eve deserved a while back in the garden. He deserved death, but once again, God is going to accomplish more. He's going to give him something worse than death. He's put a curse on him, and he's going to have to live with his guilt. And not just that, he's going to put a mark on him so that everybody that sees him is going to know he's a murderer. Now, what does Cain say to this? I am so sorry, Lord, for doing this. How did I, al- how did I kill my brother that I loved? He said, uh... My punishment's more than I can bear. He just killed his brother. See how the sins of the father? This is the woman that you gave me, Lord. This punishment's too great for me to bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Oh, now you're concerned about being killed? Do you see what sin does to us? It deceives us. And then we want to dish out, but we don't want to get what we gave. And so the first murderer was Cain. He killed his brother. And God, God's name is profaned. And it's profaned over and over and over again on this planet from people that have no value, no value in human life. Just see it as something that's disposable. First John says, do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he slay him? Because his own deeds were evil while his brothers were righteous. Instead of having righteous deeds as well, God says, if you do what's right, will you not be accepted? He was jealous of his brother Because Cain wanted for God to lower the bar for him and just be fine with what he was giving him. 
And that is the dangerous place that you and I can go to. We want to lower God's bar, and we want God to just be okay with it. In, a, in other words, we've really become God, and we want to control our Lord and tell him what to do. You accept this. This is, this is good enough for you, God. And that's never going to be okay, but that's what sin does. It deludes us. The Bible says that out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever is the overflow is what the tongue does. And we just read about what comes, what we use our tongues for, for cursing and for berating and for gossiping and for um, just slicing people up with words. And when we do that, we are revealing to ourselves who we are. When I do that, it's like, okay, Letty, look at you. What just came out of your mouth is showing what's in your heart. There's a problem. Deal with it. God is letting us know that out of what comes, if I'm negative, if I'm a murmurer, if I'm complaining, if I'm constantly just putting people down, if I can find no good in what people do, then sewer is my overflow. sin. Because when I see myself for who I am, when I see the filth in me and know that God loves me with an unfailing love, then I'm going to be willing to look beyond the filth of others and see that God loves them like he loves me and that he values me and the other person the same way. That's the complete circle there. God's forgiven me, I forgive them. And it's, we're we're good. We're doing what is right. So when you're squeezed, what comes out? Life's circumstances, and we never know from one day to another what we're going to face with a family member, with a friend at work, something that's going to happen. What happens when we're squeezed? What comes out? What is the overflow when we're squeezed? What's that overflow that comes out? Is it God's love because we have been at his feet constantly being nourished by our God so that when we're squeezed, if we pop off with something that we shouldn't say, we very quickly make it right. That is a good place to be. And don't think, well, I'm really going to try hard not to, not to anything bad to ever get squeezed out of me. Don't even think that way because it's impossible. Where we need to be is, Lord, teach me to make things right when vomit comes out of my heart, when I vomit on people because of the overflow that I've allowed to build up. Forgive me and let me go and ask for forgiveness. That is walking blamelessly before the Lord because as soon as you ask repent from your sin, guess what? You're white as snow again. Isn't that awesome? Is that not just such a tremendous thought this morning? Because I know that if you're even giving this any time of how you've used your tongue this week, the words that have come out of your mouth, and even maybe you're just thinking them, you didn't have a chance to talk them. It's depressing. It is depressing. But the good news is that we have a God whose love covers over a multitude of sins. And we are blessed that we belong to him. Incredible. We reveal most, we reveal God most when we are with other people. So the overflow is going to happen for the good or bad when we're with other people. If we're just sitting at home by ourselves, la ti da can't reveal God very much in that spot, to, in the midst of others. It's when we're others that this matters. Valuing life, valuing other people, understanding how they work so that you can help to lift others up is what needs to come out loud and clear. For you are a chosen people, a holy nation, a people 
that has been brought out of darkness into this wonderful light that you would do what? Declare his praises. Declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into light. Is his love shining through when life is squeezing you? So extremely important. And here is, here is where we are. People love violence. People do violence. And God tells us because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And when love grows cold, there is no value of life. Not at all. Love grows cold. We don't care about what God says. We're definitely not going to care about what people say. The Bible tells us that family members will turn on each other. Mothers to their children. Fathers to their sons. What is a normal, strong connection will mean nothing. It's the survival of the fittest, and I'm going to win over anybody. But understand this, in the last In the last days, terrible times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, forgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, without love of good, traitorous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, being made in God's image, but having no Holy Spirit power to overcome any of this stuff. This is where the world is moving. This is who you and I will become unless we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in our lives. When you don't value human life, this is, I don't have any value for God and, for, and value people the way that he does. This is who I will become. And it doesn't happen overnight, friends. It happens one day at a time. It happens when I elevate myself, when I put myself above God's ways, the way that Cain did, when I live to be independent and do my own thing, one day at a time before you know it, you are out. You've let the devil dance you out into a field so far away, and guess what? He's going to leave you out there in the dark, and you're all alone, and you're isolated, and there is grief and pain and suffering. The great thing is, is that the Lord can reach through anything and anyone. This was the life of, of the thief on the cross. So you and I are not the thieves on the cross because we understand the story. But this was the thief on the cross. At the very last moment, he is redeemed, and that is our God. I think about Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons in her that Jesus cast out. So being demon-possessed, and nothing the Holy Spirit can't do. His voice, those demons will shudder. They will shake at the voice of God. So you and I cannot, you, we, you and I must value every human life. We don't know what God is doing in some lives, though on the outside it may appear that they're way out. Some of these things may stand out. But if truth is, if you and I take inventory at the table for two, We'll see some of these things in our own lives. We just don't want to become this. So from Colossians, you must put aside all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your mouth. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive any complaint that you might have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on what? Love. Because it's the bond, the glue, the super glue of perfect unity. Isn't that beautiful? And that is why in order... For us to understand the sixth commandment, we have to understand that valuing human life and loving every human life the way that Jesus did and the fact that God is going to use people during the end times at the time of the, of the fifth seal to rescue the people that we just read about in 2 Timothy 
is going to be tremendous. You and I will lay down our lives to save one more during the Great Tribulation because of this. Love will bind us together. If my life can be used to save one life, Lord, take it. What's my life? This is where we need to be. This is what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. And that's why he says, the greatest of these is love. So may God in his most infinite, unfailing love impress upon you today how he values each person and how he wants to teach us how to value and how you and I, if we understand our basic needs and we allow him to meet them, then we can understand the basic needs of others and we're going to be able to bear with one another in love and value other people. Remember those four things, the need to be validated, Imagine if you and I live to be used to validate others instead of looking for validation. Imagine if instead of wanting success and achievement that we looked to see how others might receive and achieve success in their lives. Imagine if we lived to let people know that they belong to the family of God because we all have the need to belong. And imagine if we lent ourselves to the Lord that those around us would be secure because we need security. Our God is doing great things. And I, I hope and pray that as we walk this walk on our way to the promised land, that today we will understand more clearly the need to value others. Have a wonderful and delightful Sabbath.